So if you're in Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to share with you a Christmas Eve service, obviously seeing it's not Christmas Day. Tomorrow I'll be doing a service out of Luke's gospel. But today I just want to share some things related to the birth of Christ that we find here in uh, Matthew in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. So allow me to read to you and we'll get into our our evening uh, study that we're having here on Christmas Eve. Matthew writes, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. He called his name Jesus. So Matthew begins his account of the birth of Jesus with a simple introduction. These are the events surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind. So I want to begin by giving a very basic introduction. I begin by noting that this account is written in a historical narrative fashion. That's because it's written as an account of the acts of God. This is not written as a fable. It's not written as a myth. This is to be understood as a historic account. It's intended to com communicate to us actual events. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, the apostle said, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so there are those today who believe that the Christmas story is simply that. It's a myth. It's a fable. It's only a story. But you need to understand when you read your Bible that the Bible is not presenting the birth of Christ as a fable or a story or a myth, it is written as a historic account of actual facts, things that actually happened. And so the point that Peter was making and the point that I'm beginning with is it's not a myth, it's a fact. And, and the apostle Peter later on was to write and say, we are eyewitnesses of the glory of God incarnate. So the gospel is true. It's not a Greek myth. It's not a mystery religion. It is a true account of things that took place. When you begin to read your Bible and you begin in the Old Testament, you're going to find that the Old Testament is filled with many prophecies concerning Messiah. You see in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, how now that particular verse tells us that he will be born of a woman, that he will reconcile people to God, and that he will crush evil at the cost of his own life. When you look at 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, as well as verse 16, it says to us that he'll be a descendant of David. He'll establish a permanent kingdom. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the, the prophet said he will be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7, 14 tells us he will be born of a virgin. Isaiah 9, verse 6 tells us his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so when you read your Bible, you'll see that it's a historic account. You also see that the things of Christ we're actually fulfilling over 300 specific prophecies that related to the Messiah. And God had determined to rescue lost mankind. And God determined to do that through a son by, his, by the name of Jesus. And, and that was something, his plan, that was revealed over the years. It was revealed, if you will, piecemeal to his servants, the prophets. Now, when you read your Bible, once again, the prophets of the Old Testament never understood the full implication of their own messages. Their own writings were, were mysteriously held from them. In 1 Peter 1.12, again, the apostle said to them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. 
So even the writers at that time didn't have the full knowledge of how this was going to take place. They were simply inspired by God to write down certain things over the, the history of the Old Testament that were giving to us uh, images, glimpses, and words concerning a Messiah that Jesus was, was going to be, that, that God was going to send for us. You see, the thought that God would take upon himself human flesh was beyond human comprehension. We've been so calloused by sin and by the world and the way the world is that, that sometimes we may lose the, the wonder of such an event that God himself would take upon himself human flesh. And we've been so callous that we don't even realize what a wonder that really is. But the angels are not calloused. The wonder of God taken upon human flesh was beyond their imagination. These, these were things which angels desired to look into. They didn't understand it. But God had made a promise. God had made a promise of fallen man. You see, when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, God made his first promise to, to rescue us. I read uh, a moment ago, mentioned Genesis 3.15. This is what it says. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And this was a prophecy of the Messiah who was to come, who was going to be bruised when, when, he, when Jesus was, was crucified, but he would crush the serpent in his death and resurrection. And the Messiah, he said, will come. He will come by woman. He will come by woman alone without the involvement of a man. Somebody said the address is not to Adam and Eve, but to Eve. It was in consequence of this purpose of God that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. This and this alone is what is implied in the promise of the seed of the woman bruising the head of the serpent. And so Matthew here in this chapter is led by the Spirit of God to record the events of his birth in a factual way. And he does it by giving us details, and we'll look at that and uh, take apart this passage a little bit at a time. Notice again in verse 18, it says, After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together. And so we're introduced to this young virgin, a, a, a woman named Mary. And this woman was engaged to a carpenter by the name of Joseph. Bible um, commentators make the point of, of letting us know that Mary was very young. She was probably somewhere around 14 years of age. 14 years of age, maybe 15. She was a very godly young woman, a 14-year-old, and very godly. Now, having raised four children through their teenage years, I had four teenagers at the same time. I can tell you what a miracle it was for Mary to be so godly at 14. You know, when they're small and they're young, they have so many decisions that they're making. There are so many insecurities that they have. And very often, their, their insecurities, their immaturities and indecisiveness concerning life and everything, very often those kinds of things cloud their judgment. But Mary, at the age of around 14, had an opportunity to make a decision that wasn't simply going to affect her alone. It was a decision that a 14-year-old was going to make that was going to affect every human being that would be born. It would affect the entire human race forever. When you look in Luke, and I'm not saying you should turn there, but if you take notes, it's found in Luke 1, 26 through 38. In Luke 1, 26 through 38, those verses tell us that an angel by the name of Gabriel had been sent to speak to her in the city of Nazareth. And as he approached her, he told her, Rejoice, because she is highly favored of the Lord. He said, The Lord is with you, and you are blessed among women. This angel went on to say, Fear not. You have found favor with God. You will conceive, bring forth a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be the son of the highest. The throne of David will be his. And when this conversation has taken place, this young woman is overwhelmed. And she said, how can these things be, seeing that I have not known a man, seeing that I'm a virgin? And in Luke 1.35, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. In Luke 138, her response was simply, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. A young woman, 14 years old, hearing this amazing proclamation through this angel, 
She listens carefully. How is it possible that I, a virgin, could have a child? I have not known a man. No, the Holy Spirit is going to beget life in your womb. This will be Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God. And her response, let it be to me according to your word. Now, as we know in Scripture, we just read about it. Mary was betrothed to a man. This man's name is Joseph. Hebrew marriage customs involved two stages. They had what is called the betrothal, and then they had the actual marriage ceremony. When a person was betrothed, espoused, that was as good as being married. But there was a time between the actual betrothal and the marriage ceremony. But in between that time, which usually was up to a year, they were regarded as a married couple. Somebody wrote a marriage contract was made and sealed by what was called a dowry. It was paid by the groom's father. The price was based on the value of the bride. The engagement was an indefinite period of time, normally around a year, and served as a probationary period to test the faithfulness of the bride. During this period, the groom and bride had very little social contact. They were legally married, but they didn't consummate the marriage until after the wedding itself. And that's what's being said in verse 18 when it says, Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So that emphasizes the fact that Joseph and Mary had no intimate relations. Mary's virginity was an important evidence of her godliness and her purity. And that's why Mary's pregnancy is carefully presented as miraculous. Well, as this is taking place, she's found with child, verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So Joseph, regarded as the husband of this young woman, Mary, has become aware of the fact that Mary is pregnant. And I can't imagine what he went through. I can't imagine the emotions that Joseph must have experienced. For a woman to become pregnant, pregnant prior to being married was a great sin. In the Jewish community, she would have been ostracized. Not only that, it was a sin that was condemned very strictly in Scripture. And the penalty for Mary having relations with another man was capital punishment. She stood to be able to be executed for it. In Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verses 23 and 24, it reads, If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The girl, because she was in a town and didn't scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge the evil from among you. Joseph, quite obviously, was certain that Mary had been with another man. Luke 156 tells us that Mary had left the city of Nazareth, a small village some say may have had as, as few as 50 inhabitants, no more than 200. It was a small village. She had left Nazareth for three months and gone to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And she had come back pregnant. And so it's quite obvious Something had taken place, and, and notice with me again how verse 19 says, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secret, secretly. Now, he knew she could be put to death, but he thought, I want to take the more compassionate route. He could put her away. He could divorce her privately, secretly, and, and this would save her from the shame, and it would save her from uh, the harm that could come to her. So that gives us insight. I want to speak about this for just a moment because often we, we look at, at, at all of this from, from Mary's perspective, but let's take a moment to think of Joseph's perspective. It gives us insight. It gives us men insight into how a righteous man responds to something like that. It, the Bible makes it clear he chose to exercise a gracious route. He, he was saving her life, sparing her. He was showing her compassion. He was giving her mercy. And that gives to me insight as I was reading this and began to think about this. It gives me insight into how a righteous man responds. It gives me insight into why God would, would choose Joseph to raise Jesus. Because this compassion and this mercy would be how he raised Jesus, the Son of God. 
He would be raised by a man of mercy and righteousness and compassion. And that's how Jesus was, was raised, and that's how Joseph would raise him. That's the environment that, that Jesus would be raised in. He'd be raised with a very holy and godly mom and a very righteous father, a compassionate and a merciful and a loving man. So this compassion and mercy would have been the environment that Jesus was raised in. It also revealed Joseph's willingness to share a life of shame with Mary because in taking her as his wife, she would not live down the, the town gossip and belief that she had violated and had had a relationship with uh, another man, and Joseph took her and married her out of pity, some would think. It would be m a marvel to most because that just doesn't happen. But Joseph was willing to share in the shame that they would be trying to thrust upon her because he knew that his wife was pure, even when the world didn't. And the idea that, that, uh, that Jesus uh, was raised in such a way and all and and that his mother had a reputation. Well, we think of what happened in, in the uh, Gospel of John when Jesus was speaking to some who were in accusation against him, and, and they said, well, we, have, we have not been born, these people said. We haven't been born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. What they were saying is, we're not like you. You were born out of fornication. Remember, this is a small town, a small town girl. Probably had a great reputation amongst the people. People would speak concerning Mary. What a wonderful young woman. What a pure young woman. What an innocent young woman. What a godly young woman. And then you know how town gossip is. Well, I thought she was something she obviously isn't. I thought she was so good all this time. She's a party girl. And that's kind of how it would have been. She leaves. She's out of her, her parents' sight for a while. She gets knocked up. That's what they would have been saying about her. She comes back, and look how she shamed Joseph. They might have given Joseph some respect, but it would have been a wonder that this man would have married a woman like that. But Joseph was a righteous man, not a self-righteous man. You know, the Bible tells us very clearly that, that, that mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed. He was compassionate. He was merciful. And that is the visible evidence of true godliness. You see, true religion is always evidenced by Genuine compassion. True religion, a real walk with God, is always evidenced by a compassionate, loving spirit. And instead of reacting, he took his hurt and he took his concern to the Lord. In Psalm 40, verse 1, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. And so this is what's taking place. He's minded to put her away secretly, verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, boo, no, saying, wake up, Joseph. He said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This reveals how confused and perplexed he was. His mind was troubled. It was spinning. But it also gives to us insight into where our comfort in hard times comes from. It comes from heaven. It, it took the intervention of the Lord to bring comfort into the broken heart of this man, Joseph. Notice how in verse 20, the angel calls him Joseph, son of David. So that's intended to remind him that he is of David's lineage this is fulfilling a promise that God had made to King David in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, where God said, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In verse 16, he went on to say, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established Forever. That was a messianic prophecy that the, that the Messiah would reign and rule forever off of the David, uh, uh, from David's throne. He says here, do not be afraid. In other words, stop being afraid. Joseph was troubled about what he should do. If I take her as wife, she has another man. 
and I'll be taking a woman who doesn't love me but is loved by someone else. I don't know what to do, but if I divorce her, she could come under severe penalty because she's really looked at under law as an adulteress. And so this is what he's been puzzling over, and this is what he's been concerned about. But the angel's words bring him comfort. They encourage him. And, and take her, he says. Take her and cherish her. She's done nothing wrong. You can entrust yourself to her completely. Take her, cherish, honor her, and see her for what she is. See her as a pure vessel, the pure vessel that she's always been. Because God is in control. The child has been conceived through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Again, remember Mary's question to Gabriel? How will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Well, verse 21 says, she'll bring forth a son. You'll call his name Jesus. Jesus in the Hebrew, Jehoshua. Jehovah is salvation. And Jehovah is salvation. He will save his people from their sins. Again, that fulfills Genesis 3.15. I mentioned a moment ago, over 300 specific prophecies are fulfilled in the life and ministry of this one child. You see, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. His name is Jesus. He's God in the flesh. He's God with us. He is God who has come to save us from our sins. There's so much confusion in our world today. There's a lot of evil, but much of the evil that is really by Scripture declared to be and actually identified as evil is looked at as simply common culture or just the way that it is. And the Bible doesn't look at sin and make excuse for it. The Bible is very clear about it and speaks concerning it as well as the penalty for it. The wages of sin, the scripture says, is death. And so there's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one person who ever lived who can say, I am free from my sin. Not a single person. The only one who ever could was Jesus himself. And so because we're sinners, we're in the dilemma, we're in a bad place because we don't know exactly what to do. How can we be made right with God, seeing that I'm evil and he's pure. And the scripture says that God is too holy to look upon evil with any pleasure. So how can I, a guilty, sinful person, have a relationship with the pure and holy God who has nothing in common with evil? And so that dilemma, that problem that humanity have was solved by God. And this is what Christmas is all about. That God took upon himself human flesh. And God has come to be with us in order that he might be able to save us. It says in verse uh, 23, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So God took upon himself human flesh. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. God took upon himself human flesh. He came in order that he might rescue us, that he might save us from our sin. In Romans 5, 18 and 19, as, as through one man's offenses, offense, a judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one, man, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So God, loving the world, gave his son. And Christmas is celebrating the reality of the fact that God loved us and took upon himself flesh and dwelt amongst us and understands us. Jesus Christ, uh, according to Isaiah 53, is that wounded healer. He's aware of the things that we go through. There's nothing that, that I go through that he's not familiar with. He was tempted in every way such as I, but he was without sin. He understands loneliness. He understands a broken heart. He understands rejection. He understands all of those things because he was a man who was rejected and lonely himself. Even in the night that he was just before his death, he was in that, in that garden praying and he was saying, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when he died on that cross, 
He didn't do it for his own sin. He did it for us. And, and when we read the Bible, we need to understand that, that Christmas, and I think we believers do already know this, but Christmas isn't a celebration for us. It's not our birthday. It's a celebration of the reality of Christ who came to save us from our sin. That's what it is, and, and that's why we need to hear that message. We need to understand that. Jesus is God in human flesh. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus, said, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. As we celebrate tomorrow and we celebrate the reality of the birth of our Messiah, Jesus was placed in a manger, but he was also placed on a cross. He was placed in one place, but ultimately placed in the other. And he was placed on a cross so that he could die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, taking my place because he paid a debt that I couldn't pay. He took upon himself my sin and he laid his life down voluntarily for me. And that song, Mary, did you know, when you, when you kiss your baby, baby boy, you're kissing the face of God. I don't know if you know that the word that is translated most common in the New Testament for the word worship is a Greek word, proskuneo. And proskuneo speaks of something that goes forward. You're coming down forward. But it carries with it the, imit the uh, intimation of, of a tenderness and a face-to-face. -face. It's almost a picture of kissing God's face. When you're truly worshiping, you're very vulnerable, and it's an intimacy. So... That's why God says he has us to worship him in spirit and truth. Because in order to truly worship him, I need to know who he truly is. And so the gospel teaches us how to worship God. And it's not by works of righteousness, which we do, or efforts on our part. It's in the submission of and the yielding of and the asking of forgiveness for what we've done in opposition to him. It's the hostility that I have lived a lifetime in because I am in hostile opposition to God. But what God has done is he, is he has conquered on that cross. And Jesus was about to die and he said, um, it is finished. He was speaking concerning the fact that what God had called him to do was about to be completed. He was dying as a voluntary sacrifice on the cross. But it wasn't simply the death that justifies us. It's the awareness of the resurrection that gives us life. And so we're identified with Jesus Christ. So Jesus took upon himself human flesh, and we celebrate that in his birth. But he took, him, he took our sins upon him when he died on the cross, and we celebrate that at Easter. And as this resurrected Lord, who ever lives to make intercession for us, this resurrected Lord has called us to give our faith and our hearts to him, to worship him. Why? Because God is with us. Because we yielded ourselves to him because he yielded his life for us. And he is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. And that was what was taking place. And Joseph was there and he was pondering, what am I going to do? You know, I, I don't want her to, to be penalized, but I, 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 can't, I can't take her as my wife. And, and that's why the angel says, don't be afraid to do that. No, this one that is to be born of this, this woman is, is God's own son. It is God with you. And then finally, verse 24, Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and, and took to him his wife. Didn't know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. This reveals his faith as, his, as it does his obedience. God spoke. Joseph obeyed. He didn't completely understand, but he did what he was told. He married her. Before witnesses, which is the custom of that day. He took her as his wife. He married her before witnesses. He received the blessing of a priest. He had a marriage feast and a celebration. And he took her to the home he had prepared for her. He married her. The Bible makes it clear. 
he said, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took to him his wife. He did all of those things. He had his marriage celebration. He had his, his feast. He had everything, and, and he loved her. The neighbors would have seen great grace on his part because of what he did it was unheard of. And the scripture says he knew her not until after Jesus was born. He didn't, he didn't have personal intimate relations with her until after the birth of Christ. But this child, this child that will celebrate his birth tomorrow and look at passage that relates to that, this child Jesus didn't stay a child. Jesus grew to be a man. Jesus grew to be the man who would lay down his life for us. He is the Savior of the world. And we all need what he has to offer us. Have you ever, have you ever opened up your Christmas presents like you'll do tomorrow? And perhaps some of you have already been cheating and doing it tonight. Have you ever opened up a present that made you eternally satisfied to the point where you never want to get another present again? Have you ever had one of those? This is it. Don't buy me anything else. This is all I'll ever want. I've discovered that's not true with my kids, and it hasn't been true with me. My children would open up those presents, and they always did the same thing. It was so cute. They'd always open them up, and they'd go, oh, just what I wanted. Then they'd grab another box. They'd open that up. Oh, just what I wanted. Then they'd open up another box. How many boxes they got? Then they'd say, let's go to Grandma's. They always have more over there. They never were satisfied. Never. The eyes of man never are satisfied. There's never anything that we have on earth that satisfies us completely until the day comes when you are finally empty and you're finally saying, I've, I've tried it all. I've done it all. I have no purpose. I have no goals. I have no joy. I have no peace. I have nothing. And that's when the greatest present was given to you when you said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And your heart was surprised by the joy that God gives to you because you're now right with God. My sins are forgiven. My name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, I'm just passing through. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm, I'm, this is not my home. And every day is one day closer to being with the Lord who loved you and laid his life down for you. That's why Christians celebrate Christmas. Not because we're pagans, but because we have joy in our heart. For God has broken into this darkness and enlightened our darkened consciences by giving us the power of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sins. And that comes from being a Christian. It wasn't a ritual of any sort that I went through. It wasn't by going through certain classes. It wasn't by having certain sacraments. For me, what it became was what Scripture says, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. God, wash me and cleanse me and give me a new life. I'm sick of being sick. I need you. And when God came into my life, 49 years ago this Friday, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. 49 years ago, at the age of 20, I gave up. And I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of the alcohol. I'm tired of the drugs. I'm tired of the relationship. I just need peace. I need hope. I need forgiveness. I can't take it anymore. And I said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And he was. And he, he forgave me of all my sins. He cleansed me of all my unrighteousness. He wrote my name in his book of life, and he has blessed me in ways that are immeasurable, and I don't need Christmas presents. I have Jesus Christ, the reason for this season. He is my Savior, and that's what we all need. And if you don't have that, if Christmas is just another holiday that you go through and you're bored in, thinking about where am I going to go and have some drinks later on or whatever. No, Jesus Christ said, I'll give you wine New wine. Because you know what? I had enough of the old, but now he's given me the new. And I've never had a Holy Ghost hangover in my life. And I've never wondered, what did I do? Was I crazy? Who's after me after walking with the Lord and worshiping him? No, I haven't. Because you know why? Because when God, when God comes into your life, he fills every empty portion of it. And he overwhelms you with his goodness. And that is one of the reasons why I love him and I worship him. Not just Christmas, I worship him every day because he is worthy of worship every single day. He is the Savior, not just on Christmas, but every day. 
because he's our Savior, isn't he? He is our Lord, and he's the reason for us to be alive. And if you don't know him, you can.